E buongiorno. Thank you. Good morning. Grazie mille per questo invito. Thank you for e, this invitation. E gloria a Dio per l'occasione che abbiamo di condividere una, un pensiero, una meditazione, thoughts, a eh, un affetto proprio grande affection. che eh, tutti i credenti hanno, ma This io penso anche che tutti gli esseri umani, che è l'affetto alla fraternità. Beings, and that is the non potremmo vivere for senza i nostri fratelli e le nostre sorelle. E davvero vorrei iniziare proprio questo primo like momento di riflessione biblioteologica su quello che avete chiamato luogo di fedeltà, la fraternità come luogo di fedeltà al carisma e alla missione. E nella prima parte appunto, che cominciamo adesso, sarà per me davvero un grande piacere It'll be paragonare la fraternità dunque la fraternità intesa come fraternità, fraternity, fraternity understood as fidelity to um, concerto, the charism to compare it to a concert a concert that we wish to be a symphony with no musical key gradevole We hope in for it quanto gli strumenti sono perfettamente accordati tra loro. Allora direi che perché questo concerto, il so concerto della fraternità, possa davvero uh, produrre una musica really piacevole, a, uh, ci vogliono almeno tre strumenti. Uh, we at least need three instruments. The first one is the violin, the second one is the piano, the third one is the flute. These are metaphors, of course. I will compare I will compare the first director of fraternity and fidelity to the violin, verticale, that is the vertical verticale. fraternity. What do I mean by this? I mean fraternity as fidelity to the charism. So the people who preceded us, so our founderesses, our founders, but also all of those who preceded us, all the sisters who are older, Troviamo quando entriamo in una famiglia religiosa, in una congregazione. Ecco, allora chiamo questa fraternità verticale. So this fraternity, I call it vertical. Vertical and I compare it to the violin. All of them know, all of you know that the violin is the most important instrument. Oggi innanzitutto quando inizia un concerto al primo violino. The director turns to the first violin when he begins a concert. Ed ecco allora, voglio fare un esempio, un esempio tratto da un personaggio biblico che magari è meno conosciuto di, di tanti altri, è solo perché Once appunto è importante risvegliare nella Bibbia tutti, uh, tutti no, i, i, i protagonisti eh, della stessa. E allora eh, le, viene da... da per favore... Per favore, per favore cioè, um, potete vedere su che canali lei parla? Deve parlare sul canale italiano o oh, sembra che lei parla sul canale inglese. Che, che lingua lei ha scelto? Scusi, state parlando a me? Sì, 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 sì. sì. Io italiano. E, ma sul suo computer che lingua ha scelto nella traduzione, nell'interpretazione? Io... No, non lo so, questo, non so, mi è stato mandato questo, questo indirizzo, questo link. Bisogna chiedere a Beatrice. No, 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 sul suo computer c'è, um, sotto lo schermo c'è interpretazione. Sì. Lei lo vede? Io lo vedo, sì. E lei può scegliere italiano? Io vedo solo English, Russian e Spanish. 
Alors, Russia. Lei può scegliere Russia ah. per parlare italiano. Bene, grazie. Grazie. Eh, adesso, adesso va bene? Is it okay? Yes, okay. It seems... It... Oops, oops, oops. <laughs> Um, so did we, what I said so far, has what I said so far been heard? I don't know how to proceed. Should I start again? No. Okay, fine. Great. Can I continue? Okay, great. So I will resume from where I stopped. Okay. Okay, we're facing the first uh, symbolic instrument, which is the violin, and it is the symbol of the vertical aspect of fraternity. That is that aspect that uh, we choose when we enter, when we choose to belong to a religious family. We join this inheritance, an inheritance we find within this family, so we uh, are, we are attuned, we get in, we tune with something that's been existing for some time, so it requires fidelity. And I give the example of Simone Maccabeo. He is the last of the brothers. When he, when his brother dies, I there's a problem. There's a technical issue because the professor is hearing an echo, so she's going to try to move forward. But there's an issue. So when Simon is uh, has to govern Jerusalem, has to govern his uh, people, he knows that uh, he's not the one who's going to found uh, to his people, but uh, he knows that he is a, su a successor. He's a successor of the one who preceded him. So the government of Simon is interpreted by himself as a service within a succession a succession of uh, people who carried out this task. In chapter 13, Simon says, for my brothers died for this cause, all of them for the cause of Israel, and I was left alone. There's an act of gratitude on his part gratitude for his brothers. In this act of gratitude, Simon is showing his humility and his fidelity. Fidelity is a context of life when you enter fidelity. Fidelity is not a virtue. It is not a personal virtue. It is recognizing that we are entering a context of life. We are entering a world where many before us have truly given their lives. And uh, Simon recognizes this and recognizes that it is now his turn because his brothers have died. So how does he show it? What's the first, his first note, the first note of, the, of his violin, his will in verse 5 of chapter 13 of the first book of the Maccabees. Never will I spare life in front of any tribulation because I am not more important than my brothers. This expression is very significant. It's very meaningful and it is truly essential to enter this vertical fidelity. Each of us is not more important than our own brothers. But with joy, we have to enter the offer 
that was given already by uh, each brother or sister who preceded us and we have to do this through through our own offering i will not spare my life as i face any tribulation my brothers have faced so many tribulations and i will be no less this is an expression of gratitude and humility while it is essential to enter a fraternity and to truly live fraternally in our own religious family following the example of simon maccabee as he lived his fraternity with his people the reason why he gives himself he questions himself he challenges himself he takes up a responsibility for his family and his people and and as we see in verse 9 the people will recognize the sacrifice done by simon that was for the life of the entire people the the people will say in verse 9 fight our war and whatever you will command us to do we will do of course it is a language of war we can understand this as uh, that uh, struggle that is represented by our fraternal life because fraternal life is a struggle it is a battle it is uh, a work that we must achieve it is a building that we must erect fraternity is not something static it is not something that is fixed it is not something that we receive as a, a document a driver's license no it is an act of life it is an inheritance a legacy that is given to us an inheritance delivered by those who preceded us, uh, those who managed to earn this. Uh, and when we enter, we must immediately move, uh, be in motion to improve, uh, to grow and to improve the situation for the sake of our community the people is our community fight our war it, he says and whatever you will say whatever you will ask us uh, to do we will do and we'll be in solidarity with you what did uh, judas uh, Mac maccabee did there's a chant there's an a hymn uh, for his life in chapter 14 in the first book precisely it is a uh, sweet and beautiful what he sees uh, acknowledged through this chant is sweet there was peace in the land of judas for the entire life of Simon, in the bible and in the world in history in the experience of humanity there's no greater good than peace so this first instrument the violin has to truly make us feel the note of peace those who enter fraternity in this vertical uh, fid uh, fidelity that we are talking about it is it'll be someone who's seeking peace who's building peace who's acting uh, for peace uh, who becomes a bridge a bridge a, a, among the brothers and sisters to truly be a body of peace he sought the good the good for his people he appreciated his power because simon is then the king of the jews the king of jerusalem but just as all of us even as sisters even if we do not have a role of authority we will always have our baptism statue of being kings you know that through baptism we all become kings prophets and uh, priests we have a universal priesthood we have a prophecy we have a task all of us who are baptized but we also have a royalty we are kings along with uh, jesus who's a king 
and along with uh, all of those who participated to the inheritance of fraternity in the Bible. So there's royalty in being faithful to our fraternity. And this royalty is expressed through the search for the goodness of the sisters and those who surround us, the search for the goodness. Jesus showed us uh, the goodness. He extended the borders of his people. He chased from his people. He chased uh, the residues and they started uh, cultivating their land. These are characteristics. These are things that Simon achieved, which become some signs, uh, guides, examples of, for us. These are strong invitations to do the same. Fraternity, vertical fraternity in gratitude for those who preceded us, those who did great things, those who did the things that Simon did. We have to tune ourselves to all of this and do the same with different expressions, with uh, different achievements. We will achieve other things, but there will be for the sake of our community. We may, I don't know, establish new houses, uh, channel our uh, commitment differently. We'll find other mission fields uh, as compared to our formators or those who have preceded us. But the direction will also, will always be the vertical direction of uh, cultivating peace, goodness, and this uh, land, which is a fraternity, so that it can uh, give its fruits and products. There's a scene that we will then look at from what is, there's a beautiful scene, what's peace? Peace is to sit together, to speak amongst us, feel the beauty of this verse. The old people sat in the squares and all were interested in the goodness. The old people who were seated in squares so they could learn the, the news or the information they were informed of whatever happened in town. So they were not excluded. The elderly were not excluded. The Pope speaks a, a lot of a throwing away of the people who are discarded. And he often mentions the situation of uh, the old people and the children, those who are discarded. The vertical fraternity allows us to discard no one. The elderly sat in the squares and were interested in whatever was good. And there were certainly no bitter words. It can happen that when we grow old, even in communities, we kind of become a little bitter. Sometimes we give in to the temptation of criticizing what uh, younger people do. I mean, they have their own roles uh, and they are out on the field, uh, but we cannot do this. The elderly have to sit in squares, which means that they know what is happening in the house. It is, uh, it is not it is not appropriate to not inform the elderly of what we do nowadays, although they may not have uh, any responsibility, direct responsibility, but everybody should be aware of what we're doing in the community. But it is also appropriate for the elderly to be interested in goodness, to just capture everything that uh, the younger sisters are doing that is positive and help them carry their mission forward. And uh, as uh, the ninth verse says in the second part in the 14th chapter, the young wore beautiful coats and wore armors, of course, so, because the young had to fight. 
So we also consider war as a metaphor to say that, that there is a struggle, this battle, this struggle is a struggle of fraternity. And the young people with the, the had the appropriate strength because in order to build fraternity, you need strength, you need energy, you need science, you need knowledge, the will, you need will. So the young people are metaphorically those who are at the front line and everything converges and you see how this uh, concert which was begun by the violin and this concert begins to express its beauty beauty and harmony and the peace reigned over the country each sat it under each sat under his own uh, tree and no one uh, transmitted fear the, the verse 12 is very touching because it mentions it says two things the first thing it says is each should have a good spot in the community if you can truly call this a community fraternal. Everyone has to feel at ease and feel comfortable in his or her space. Nothing must be missing. These are fruits. These are fruits that give life. Uh, there's the fig. We could think that uh, these fruits are perhaps superfluous. So the, the fruits that are brought by these trees are wine and figs, but wine represents joy. So each one has to have his or her part of joy in our houses if we really want to bring fraternity. And we all have, we all need our part of sweetness, of uh, uh, gentleness, of tenderness. Otherwise it doesn't work. The fruit of the fig, there's a lot of, uh, symbol in this fruit that well, this is about the sweetness in life because community the community can truly be called the fraternity and sorority if it has sweetness within it if we feel good in our homes all of us has her own part of joy sweetness so we can truly feel the beauty of being together. Being together is important, it's essential. Nobody must be forgotten. No one has to represent a weight in the community, but everybody needs his or her space. The promised land is described by God as he presents it to Moses in the third chapter of Exodus. It is presented as a beautiful land a, an ample and spacious land where there's room for everyone. These are the fraternities that we have to build. And in order to do this, we have the inheritance, the legacy of those who preceded us, the legacy of those who are older than us in our own communities. There's another instrument that is used to play metaphorically what we call another direction of fraternity with that we refer to as horizontal so we've talked about vertical fraternity we're talking about fidelity to the charism fidelity to the charism re requires three instruments to become real concrete we already talked about the vertical fraternity. Now we talk about horizontal fraternity and the symbolic instrument is the piano. The piano, because a piano has many keys. So we think, let's think about how we can horizontally build our fraternity. That is a relationship with our sisters. And of course we, are going to mention the 
sung to love in the first uh, letter to Corinthians by Paul. And I'm going to offer my own humble translation, of course, because a few months ago, we published a book about three women who translate and read the works of Paul. And I had to translate the first letter to the Corinthians. So I humbly share my own translation interpretation. Love has an ample breath. Verse 4 in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. Love uh, wants uh, what is good. This is uh, the translation of the first uh, verb. Macro timeo in Greek. Macro means big. So openness uh, to breathing love. Agape. It is translated more as love, but it used to be translated as charity. We can think that love is charity. These are synonyms. Love is an ample breath. How important it is to think about this breath, uh, especially when we think about the effect of uh, coronavirus, uh, that is the lack of air, hunger for air. So if it is uh, true that there's a virus that attacks uh, the heart, and, and Sister Beatrice already mentioned it, which is individualism, selfishness, closeness. The lack of fraternity is what attacks our heart. Lack of fraternity is a need for air. So Paul tells us, what is the solution for this lack of fraternity? It is love, it is agape, because love, as you may recall, you may recall that the colored man who said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Love is breathing for all those who are suffocating. Think about how the fruits and effects of violence are truly so many forms of uh, suffocation. Love is giving oxygen. Love is open. Love wants what is good. This openness is immediately translated into feeling. It is translated into a cure, an affection. We are quickly, these verbs quickly describe what we need to do to be connected, to be linked horizontally with our sisters. How can we create a network? Because fraternity is built, it's a network amongst us, it's horizontal. We spoke about what is vertical before this communion with those who preceded us. It is about uh, entering this note of our community, but then playing together, playing the piano, each of us has to play her own key, but in order for this to happen, we need a relationship. Relationship is made of love. And Paul mentions 15 verbs, and Pope Francis often mentions this. I'm going to quote Fratelli Tutti, but he spoke at length of this chant to this hymn to charity in Amoris Letizia. So, loving, well, love is a gift, of course, but when you breathe it, it is an oxygen that immediately transforms. So we breathe in love, it gives us oxygen, and then we breathe out benevolence. We give back, we give oxygen back as goodness, because love wants what is good. This is, uh, of course, uh, these verbs uh, in the Bible, all the verbs that characterize the action of God, the fruit of the Spirit, these are the verbs. 
that were quoted this macro Timeo, these are the verbs that are typical of our the actions of the apostles and all the Christians, not just the apostles. All the actions uh, that were are offered to the weak. There's love and benevolence uh, offered to the weak. There's so many texts, but I cannot mention them all. And then the verbs that follow what is negative. Love is not envious. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, look for its own interest it doesn't hate it doesn't have the, it doesn't maintain a black book of the evil that was received it does not rejoice in injustice but it rejoices in truth it is not envious envy pope francis has uh, often mentioned this since the beginning of his pap papacy even on occasions when his uh, when the people he spoke with were priests, even religious people, religious uh, brothers and sisters, envy, jealousy, and uh, murmuration. He was also quite tough to you religious uh, with you because you received more in the church, so you have to give more. So envy, envy is a sign of immaturity in general in the Bible. It's a sign of uh, lack of uh, perception of what fraternity is. What is fraternity? Fraternity is a place where we build a body. This body is made of so of many members and each member has its own charism, its goodness, function, role, its own talent, each and every member. So to envy the member of the other is, is something that is immature, it is childish, because what the other has is for me. Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, he says, if the entire body were an eye, where would the ear be? So to envy the charism of the other means to not make your own charism fruitful. So envy is truly childish. It is what represents the stupidity in some way. There's no reason to be envious of others. There is a duty to welcome the charism of the others, to benefit from the charism of the other. If there are sisters in our community with great charisms, we have to be happy because our community will truly be a fraternity because they will offer this charism and we can all benefit from it. You are not to load, you're not to practice personal exaltation, which is something that was practiced among Corinthians, and it is also very spread amongst us. We are filled with pride when we do something good. No, because when you're filled with pride, when you gloat, since we've done something good, then it means that the others. Uh, are worthless that when you glow that means that you are filled with your own with yourself and you no longer have the possibility to look to the others respect also respect is very important in order to build a horizontal fraternity you have to respect your own body your own person therefore the body of the other and the person the other person and then you have to not act based on your own interests, to avoid individualism precisely. We pronounce this vow of poverty. What does it mean? It means that everything we do, it doesn't mean we have nothing. No, it means that ultimately we'll have what? What we we'll have even more because whatever we do we place in the great basket of the fruits that uh, will 
be a benefit to everyone. So those who act for our own interest, if you act for your own interest, you divide the community, you destroy fraternity because you just begun, you just become the owner of what you just have. So that's is this is what it means to not act for your to act for your own interest. When you do not act for your own interest, you just put everything you have and everything you build at for the benefit of everyone. And we do not uh, take this title of owner, propri proprietor. And you, and the paroxysm, you do not uh, gloat, you do not uh, go out, to go beyond your limits in the Bible. God sometimes is angry, but the prophets who love the people of Israel, God is angry with an unfaithful people but the prophets say lord forgive us lord understand us we do we are not entitled to be angry to go beyond our limits we are not entitled to be angry with our sisters because we too set we do not we we too can express some reasons to be can offer the other people to be angry with us. So the Lord can be enraged, but then he has a dialogue with us, a dialogue, a discussion, a listening, but not rage, because as you know, you know how rage begins, but you do not know how it can end. The rage can begin by screaming or throwing something to the ground or or it can begin with a word, a word that should not be pronounced, perhaps a, a word that is uh, overloaded with negative passion. It can also lead to physical violence. It does not, uh, you must not keep a black book of the evil that was received. You must not uh, hold a grudge. You are not to write on your black book whatever he or she did to you you know, the black book of uh, bad deeds of others against us. Those who love, when love does not write, it does not take notes on the black book. You do not keep an account to then perhaps take revenge in the future. We have to be very careful. We do, we have to care for our heart. Love comes from God, the Lord, gives this love to us, but then love has to be built and cared for. This is what horizontal fraternity is, because perhaps one word pronounced by a sister 10 years ago will still be remembered. So we hold this grudge against the sister and one day, if we run into this uh, sister in this in a condition of weakness we will bring out that revenge so we should not uh, keep an account of the evil do not uh, rejoice in injustice we have to be happy in truth love does not rejoice in injustice that is the bad things the evil things that others do within the community this is what uh, this articulation of love means amongst us someone someone may rejoice if he or she sees a sister's falling for example well that's not good you cannot rejoice in whatever happens whatever bad happens to others you have to rejoice in truth um ask a question i knew the schedule the schedule schedule was from 9.30. 9.30 I was to give my first contribution from 9.30 to 10.15. We began 10 minutes late. So I ask you, can I conclude? Which means perhaps five more minutes. I think I'll have five more minutes. Or should I stop and then continue? You decide.
you can uh, continue for five more minutes so you can conclude your first contribution. Okay. I will stop at 10.25. If I'm missing something, I'll resume later, okay? Okay, I'm talking of the importance of the truth. Someone who rejoices in truth. This is a word that we must look into because oftentimes in our homes, in our houses, in our communities, fraternity is prevented. This horizontal fraternity is prevented by a lack of expression of truth. It happens, uh, there are many experiences, important experiences uh, in uh, life. There are religious experiences that strongly involve the life of uh, the church, representing an important uh, testimony of life. For example, for the laity, the communities uh, suddenly break. Uh, someone is sent away, someone is dismissed, or there are separations, just as it often uh, happens in uh, Christian married couples to separate. And this often happens suddenly. The truth is that nothing happens uh, overnight. It's just that suddenly what was uh, underneath this division is revealed. One day it appears and becomes real and leads to even physical separations. So one part will move into one house, a different house. So why does this happen? This happens because there's no dialogue, no real dialogue. The absence of a word of dialogue is the cause for the catastrophes that we are often faced with. So truth is something that is uh, extremely important. But of course, we ha you have to know how to make the truth. Jesus defines himself as truth in John. Jesus says the truth will set you free. It will allow you to live fraternity, to live in the joy of fraternity, but what does it mean? How can you build this truth? With courage, you have to be courageous to have the courage to say what's within yourself. You have to have patience, you have to be patient, you have to be uh, docile and uh, use sweetness in expressing the truth. You also have to be responsible in saying the truth and choose the appropriate times to involve our sisters into a analysis of the truth. It is a science. Truth is really uh, something scientific, but Paul says that love cannot happen without truth. And I want to conclude precisely with uh, a number from Fratelli Tutti, number 227, where Francis speaks of the truth precisely. He says, in fact, truth is an inseparable companion of justice and mercy. All of three together are essential in building peace. On the other hand, each of them prevents the others from being altered. Truth must not lead to revenge. T saying the truth often means uh, reporting, denouncing some acts, some evil or negative uh, acts than sisters may have uh, committed, or even uh, confessing what we ourselves have committed. So you need courage. 
you need courage to report, to denounce the evil that we have caused in our community. When this evil is not uh, understood by all, but it is it is also very difficult to denounce the evil you see in others. So Francis says, to say the truth, to speak the truth, or to do to to do the truth, does not lead to revenge. It is rather to be reconciled and for forgiveness. Truth is recognizing the pain of the victims. Saying the truth about acts of violence means, first of all, to recognize, to give a voice to the pain of the victims. Oftentimes there are victims in our communities who suffer uh, this violence caused by the sister. So it is a duty to, to make the truth, to, to give a voice to this pain in the victims. In a, on a path, in a search for reconciliation and not revenge. Francis concludes by saying that every violence committed against a human being is a wound in the flesh of humanity. So in our horizontal work for fraternity, we have to we have to start from these words, begin with these words by Francis, and we have to find our inspiration in uh, the biblical word in order to heal our communities and heal our the, all the wounds that do not allow us, do not transmit health to the body of fraternity. I will stop because we run out of time. I will have another half hour, so I will briefly summarize the third instrument in charismatic fidelity, and then I will speak of fidelity to the mission. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We now take... We now take a 10-minute break, and we come back to for the second part of her report what you're telling us is very important and we want to listen to you with all our heart so we return to 10 at 10 40 we come back to our meeting room thank you
Then, if you show me Va bene, allora riprendiamo eh, con la professoressa Rosanna. We resume with Professor Rosanna, who will conclude her report, her address, and then we will give you some instructions for the groups that we'll have later. Okay, so we now give the floor to Rosanna again. Uh, do I have half an hour or should I break at 11? No, at, at 11.15. Okay. Okay, 11.10, 11.15. Okay, somebody is asking... is asking for a text for the text of this uh, uh, presentation. If uh, you want to, I can send you a written text, but I, cause I need to add it. I have to add it, but you can find the quotes and many things because there's little time. I have no, I cannot send you the whole thing, but okay, I'll resume. So I need to conclude. Okay, so fraternity as fidelity to the charism. We were speaking of the importance of the truth. That's where we broke. So we can start the... Uh, doing a sort of balance. Everything that is opposed to love can be called, uh, referred to as individual selfishness. So we understand why Paul began by saying that even the greatest charisms, and he says this at the beginning of chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, and the most, the biggest works that we can accomplish will be voided will be nothing unless they were done with love. So any deed, any act of a person within this uh, tree of fraternity is a sort of exodus toward the others. So it is an act of love. And Pope Francis helps us understand and he takes our hand, he leads us in order to live this horizontal fraternity. We are at number 245 of Fratelli Tutti. I often suggested a principle that is necessary in order to build social friendship. Unity is greater than conflict. It doesn't mean pointing to syncreti syncretism or absorption of the one and the other, rather the resolution of a greater plan that maintains the precious potential of uh, polarities that are opposed. What uh, some of you said at the beginning, fraternity indifference. Pope Francis has been uh, speaking of this uh, polarity of presence within a community, but they are not uh, aimed at excluding uh, each other. They, these are different poles, but they're not in contrast, but they are converging. And we know, as the Pope says, that each time we learn to aim higher than ourselves, going beyond our personal interests. Francis will then say this, I cannot uh, uh, speak of this uh, at length, but Francis refers to this uh, <clears throat> about uh, single people. He says when an individual, when an individual refers 
to him or herself, to his or her interests within a community. But this also applies to a community. Sometimes communities can be individualistic. A small group, a small community can also consider itself as different or better than others and accumulate. And this is negative. Well, Francis says we need understanding a mutual, the mutual commitment that transforms us so that conflicts and tension can reach a unity, a multifaceted unity that is generative of new life. A couple of words to summarize this complex uh, speech by the Pope about the relationship between the single person and the community. It is important to look in one direction. The direction cannot be the direction of oneself, self-reference. It has to go beyond the boundaries of one's own littleness, but it has to be capable of capturing the importance, the beauty and the duty of building something that is in common and of guarding, of safeguarding something that goes beyond our personal interests. To conclude with this uh, ode to love, he uses four verbs, which are positive. Everything is excused. Everything is uh, withstood. Well, this, I am a, a mother, I have a family. How many times uh, do I think of these because in a family you really have to use these verbs every day even more in fraternity or in sorority everything is forgiven this means that let's put these ver verbs together some gestures are, are made, some words are expressed, negative uh, and bad things happen uh, in our homes. So all is forgiven uh, means to think about what is good and not think about what is uh, bad. We have to presuppose that a word was a certain word was not really intended as such. I mean, you're all women and you're all mothers and sisters in community, so you know what all this means. Everything is covered. This does not mean to cover the truth. We've already said this. But everything believes, everything gives credit, everything still believes. The sister may have limits, it's true, but I still want to believe in her. She's made many mistakes, but I resist in still believing that the Lord can still do great things through her. Be we get our strength, our strength to change our attitude. The strength comes from the trust the confidence that God has for us. This is very important. We get our strength from uh, confidence, from trust. Everything hopes, everything withstands. That is, you carry the weight of everything. Each, each of us, each person who wants to be faithful to our fraternity's charism. So in order to build this horizontal fraternity, we have to feel this weight and also feel the joy of the good and the bad that is of all of us and not just feel our own. We cannot only carry the weight of our virtues 
or defects. We cannot only carry that. We have to carry the one, the ones of all. So everything is supported. Everything is carried, and love is what remains. Love is what gives life. At the beginning, it is what uh, opens uh, our lungs and feeds us with oxygen, but it is also what remains in every charism and uh, ministry that we can carry out in our community and through every deed, through every action, through every commitment, what remains is love. The third instrument is the flute. And I mention it as a symbol, uh, a third uh, register in uh, fraternity within the fidelity to the charism. And this is the open fraternity. We, the Pope said recently in an interview, we have to go from the us, from the I to the us, the flute, is an instrument that is uh, rather sweet, that is seducing uh, while reaching very far. We imagine this flute as uh, an instrument uh, that is divine. It is an instrument that is used to, to call, it leads us uh, outward. So I would mention two notes about this uh, open fraternity. We've mentioned vertical fraternity, horizontal fraternity. Now we're going to talk about open fraternity. So two notes. The first one, what does open fraternity mean? It is a sort of uh, example, theoretic example of what uh, Jesus says, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, I will be among them. So open fraternity is a way of living one's own consciousness, one's own person. Uh, it's a way of living ourselves. How do we live? How do we conceive ourselves? Perhaps we conceive ourselves as a single person. It's true. We are individuals, but we are inserted uh, through baptism into the religious community. At that point, we stop being individuals. We are people in relations. It is, uh, there's a beautiful thing that is uh, seldom said. There's no single vocation. Moses is called by God for his great task of uh, liberation of the people from slavery. But Moses will not say yes until God sends him his brother Aaron. And uh, from here all the way to me, even through Mary and Elizabeth, Mary and Elizabeth live a single vocation in uh, between the two of them. Remember the text of the visitation, the Annunciation, when the angel asks uh, Mary to become the mother of God's son, she raises objections initially. And then when she learns that Elizabeth, uh, her relative, uh, is also pregnant, it is then that Mary says, here I am. I truly am uh, the servant of the Lord. And she runs uh, toward Elizabeth. Vocation is there for a teamwork. So fraternity, fraternity that will start calling sorority because there's a difference between male fraternity and female sorority. The feminine, uh, the feminine part leads us to have different experiences uh, and the vocation is different. But this is just to speak of the importance of being a two or more open fraternity. It is uh, an open person, the person and the religious sisters who 
constitutes herself as a partner of her own sister. We are together. We live our vocation together. The other note concerns the openness, the opening of our religious houses to toward the outside, openness toward other fraternities. There is a fraternity on the way, a fraternity that is uh, built as we go out, as we put ourselves in a relationship with those who are outside, those who are outside of our walls. Even with those uh, who Pope Francis uh, uh, pushes uh, to establish fraternities, he wrote this document, Fratelli Tutti, in a chorus that is together with uh, with the one representing the voice of the Muslim word, along with the Orthodox, even the non-believers. So there's a fraternity in evolution, which asks us to bring down the walls, every wall. Pope Francis invites us to go out. It is important today for religious communities to establish fraternities with the laity in the church, with lay people, with families, because we lay people need to establish fraternities with them and they need to establish it with us because the church is a body and the different members have to be in communion among them and there have to be some uh, some junctures among them so number 89 in fratelli tutti speaks of uh, not reducing our own life to a relation with a small group, even my family. It is impossible to understand myself without a broader weave of relations. My relation, my relationship with a person that I respect cannot uh, ignore that this person is only a, the fact that they do not live only for me, nor do I live only for them. Our relationships, if healthy and authentic, opens uh, to opens us to others who expand and enrich us. The others are all those who are outside of our homes. The closed groups and, and the self-referential couples, he says that closed groups and self-absorbed couples that define themselves in opposition to others, that is, that withdraw that are closed within themselves. That's the risk of uh, being closed and the risk of saying that uh, we will solve our problems alone, th that will keep our problems within uh, our four walls. This is a temptation. Fraternity needs oxygen, we said. It has to be open. This third point is very important and it is very current because Pope Francis concludes by saying that closed fraternities sometimes can become uh, sects. Uh, they can become, um, they can be enslaved by those who in some communities are like a guru. The one who truly interprets the correct way of um, living a vocation. It is very risky. Being withdrawn and being closed is always risky. The open fraternity is the guarantee that we put forth uh, during experiences with people or messages, uh, new messages or new experiences we do not uh, possess. So we may also be submitted to criticism. 
with regard to how we live fraternity. Those who are different from us help us to see if anything needs to be corrected. So on the one hand, we are led to practice self-criticism. On the other hand, we can also be enriched. So Pope Francis says that uh, oppositions, uh, uh, the oppositions uh, uh, um, between uh, myself and the us are expressions of selfishness and of mere self-preservation leading to negative fruits. If we speak of a fidelity and mission, Uh, with the, in this regard, I've underlined two moments, fidelity to the mission and therefore how we need to live this fidelity to the mission that is uh, so important for us. At this point, as a sorority, fraternity sorority, I will also add this word that is um, referred to women. So the first conjugation is uh, with beauty. So fidelity to the mission, this means fraternity, the beauty of fraternity. There's nothing more convincing or seducing than beauty. We often raise the issue, especially in Europe, we all will often raise the issue of vocations. We want to find ways to somehow persuade young women to join our houses, our homes. So there is a secret that the Bible reveals, which you probably already knew. What is seducing is beauty. Beauty is seducing. There's a book that beautifully explains this through a drama, a loving uh, drama, the canticle, how beautiful you are, my friend. If with no beauty, there's no seduction. There may be good things, but beauty and goodness are all, always uh, hand in hand in the Bible. So beauty in the Bible is precisely the sign of God's hand. Do not forget that Moses was saved precisely because he was handsome, he was beautiful. His mother saw he was beautiful, so she hides him. However, Saul, was elected as the first king of Israel because he was beautiful, he was handsome. So what is beauty? Beauty is a sign of God. Samuel sees that Saul is beautiful and he says this and sees and concludes that he was the chosen one by God to reign over Israel. The beauty we speak of, the beauty that the Bible speaks of is not the external aspect, the appearance. It is not a requirement in the canticle because the beloved one in the canticle says, I'm dark, but I'm beautiful. And to be dark at the time meant to be a peasant. It was not a sign of external beauty. But what is it that makes her beautiful? The eye of the the eyes of the one who's uh, seeing her beauty is the first form of fidelity to the mission to the mission because beauty is a reflection of god's eyes on us on our communities the bride in the canticle is uh, beautiful because he sees her and he illuminates her in every detail of her body we are beautiful because god loves us there's no fidelity to the mission unless there is this mirroring of God's love unto us. The groom who loves us, we have to become all of this. We have to work at it. This is our initial, our first mission to liberate, to illuminate, to show that beauty 
which is the gift we have, our precisely our fraternities. Of course, the psalm in this text, Psalm 133, how beautiful, how sweet, how sweet it is for brothers to live together as uh, how sweet, how beautiful the beauty of a fraternity lies in this reflection, the eyes of God who look at us and pour beauty onto all of us. Beauty, light, colors, gentleness, tenderness, courage. Think of how the bride in the canticle is described and transfer all of this to your fraternities and sororities. She's also very courageous. Beauty is also the courage to go out and look for your beloved. Beauty is also the courage to divest yourself, to allow yourself to be loved. There are metaphors that you can articulate and apply. I do not need to add anything to this. However, I ask you to please remember that the first note of the mission is the testimony of a fraternity as beauty and as joy. Let's go back to Psalm 133. We have this great uh, luck, the word of God. The word of God is truly the musical sheet for all these uh, instruments. That is the concert of our fraternity and how good and how beautiful and how pleasant is it as the Psalm 133 says for the brothers to live together, how beautiful it is to feel this joy of being together. It's like a scented oil that uh, is spread all over your face and uh, trickles down your beard, this uh, scented oil. If there's joy in a community, if there's beauty and life in a community, those who visited will feel that uh, in the perfume and the scent as you enter you just feel it you smell it just as in the canticle he recognizes her because of her perfume think about about the senses the involvement of the senses whatever is in a community if there's true testimony of joy and shared life if there's reciprocal love if there's no solitude because this psalm celebrates the defeat of uh, loneliness. And you may recall that loneliness is that thing that God says is not good. It is not good for the human being to be alone. We can recognize the joy in Psalm 133 comes from this. How beautiful is it for the brothers to be together because this is the good thing. We're not made to be alone. Think about this at this time when people are forced to be alone. Think about the testimony of your communities. You may be three, four, five, six, seven. You're together. You're not alone. This is the first mission, a mission of joy. And as I was saying, if there's joy, if there's that fullness, that beauty, that is communion, fraternity, the sweetness of common life, you can feel that if somebody comes up from the outside, if you and have guests for lunch, your guests will feel that in the taste of the food, not as far as how the food was prepared, cooked, it could be tasty, or not, but how you eat, how you have your meal, you feel that around the table. The canticle 
gives us these five senses to recognize if we love each other. We cannot cheat. How do we eat together? We can even not speak, not say anything. It's not about the words. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. The perfume, the taste, touch. How do we embrace, whether we embrace or not, how we approach each other? There the Lord ordered the blessing for eternal life. The first mission, the first note of our fidelity to the mission is the joy of living together, the beauty of fraternal life, the light of sorority. That is all we can give testimony of. The testimony of joy is the testimony of fraternity. It is a testimony of faith. There's no mission that is not a testimony. We can only be missionaries of sorority and the joy that truly exists amongst us as we live together. The second point, fidelity to the mission, is then interpreted as responsibility, responsibility, carrying the weights for each other. I would call this a fruitful sorority, fertile sorority. And with the many there are many examples that we can uh, mention, that we can draw from the Bible. And I'll choose one, Judith. I quoted uh, verse 11 from the long prayer of Judith in chapter 9 in her booth. She says, your strength is not on the numbers. You are the God of the humble. You are the saviors of the little ones, the refuge for the weak, the protector of uh, those uh, who have no trust, and the savior of those desperate. Judith is a widow. She has no role whatsoever. She has no ordered ministry in the church. She is not a priest. She is not a bishop. She's not a cardinal, nor is she a minister. She has no position, no role whatsoever. She's simply a widow, and she's a woman who is weak by statutes. Since she's not a soldier, she has no weapons to save her people. But she, she pr probably, she is not asked to do anything for her people, but her people, her town is under siege. And her people is, are facing death or exile, perhaps. So the people are between life and death. And this woman feels the responsibility the responsibility in the face of the humble, the little ones, the weak, the desperate. And these are her fellow citizens. So this woman, although nobody calls her, she goes out, uh, she goes alone. She feels the responsibility to save her people to respond to the cry of the mothers, the mothers who see their children being killed, the cry of the elderly who are dying uh, of uh, thirst, of hunger. So fidelity to the mission, this fidelity calls for the courage to feel who the weak, the poor, and the desperate are today. At the time of our foundress, these were some today. They are different. They're 
they are others. This responsibility asks us to get on our feet. We have to know the needs of the church and the society in which we live, the needs of the church and the world. So responsibility, what is responsibility? It is first of all, intelligence. We have to decide in order to practice intelligence, a critical intelligence that is calling us. Who must we go to? Who is calling us? And this intelligence also calls for the capability to abandon old structures that have become a weight in order to respond to this fraternity to today's mission. So fraternity must be fertile and fruitful. Our missions cannot be pre-established. Missions open up to what the world asks for today and open up to what the church is asking for today. It can be asked explicitly or implicitly. The church needs women. The church needs the sisters. It needs you. Yesterday, the Pope published the last motu proprio about the access of uh, women to non-ordained ministries of electorate. In his motu proprio, he wrote, he notes the urgency to rediscover co-responsibility, the co-responsibility of all those who are baptized in the church and particularly the mission of the laity. And within this uh, mission of the laity, precisely because um, women cannot ha have no access to these ordained ministries, precisely women are called, therefore they will be entitled to to serve the altar and the service of the word because so that they can have a real incidence in the organization of these ministries and the most important decisions with regard to the word and the altar. And he adds, in guiding communities and as community, he refers to parochial and diocesan communities. So this is a beautiful thing. So the Pope says that this access is being uh, provided these uh, ministries uh, that uh, are not ordained and which until yesterday were only accessible by men but as of today women may also have access to these and along with these ministries there are many other responsibilities that we have and that we must uh, pick up and as we are equipped with judith's courage who as Nobody called her as she saw her city dying. She calls her senators and she says, we have to do something different than what you've decided. So responsibility for the mission we have, that is our sorority intended as fidelity to our mission. It is a prophecy. It requires a strength of prophecy. Prophets, the prophets used uh, new words. They captured and identified new paths because they have a very fine hearing. They could hear almost like God and God 
was confiding, was uh, saying what he felt with regard to what our world expects. Our cities uh, are begging to have something and the church, if you look at it from within and from the outside, the church is asking for, for the same thing, for the church asks us to offer. So I'll stop right here. I have some questions that I prepared. There are two because Sister Beatrice asked me to to formulate some questions at the end uh, of my two contributions, my two meditations. And these are very simple. The first one refers to the first part, that is fidelity to the charism, fraternity as fidelity to the charism. You may recall that I mentioned three areas and I took three instruments uh, as uh, symbols, uh, the violin uh, to symbolize vertical fraternity, the piano as horizontal fraternity and the flute as the open fraternity. I ask you, I mean, the question that I'm raising, you can also raise different uh, questions. You can ask yourselves different questions, but I'm asking you, which of these three instruments, in your view, needs to be tuned, in your view? Do you know what it means to tune an instrument, to, to arrange it, to align it with the notes of the other instruments? So which, which of these instruments is not fine-tuned? Which instruments is out of tune? You know, one instrument out of tune is sufficient for the concert to be a failure. We say that is cacophonic, the sound will be bad. So all three instruments need to be fine tuned. So which in your view is out of tune? First question. Second question concerning fraternity and fidelity to the mission. And the question is, which, and in between parentheses, I say new, new, which can also be old. So which responsibilities uh, between brackets new, which responsibilities of the women and of the religious, of uh, religious women toward the church and society? In society, there's, everyone, there's the woman, the children, the elderly, we have all the categories we saw in Judith's prayer. So which, and in between brackets, new responsibilities of the women and of the religious women. Are you seeing today, are you capturing today to, toward the church and society. What re new responsibilities are you seeing today with the church and society? Thank you for your very deep